And in recent months, forced DNA was found in what was supposed to be beef products. This is what's most controversial. Every year, thousands of live horses are fresh, raw horse meat. You question everything about yourself. Are you really making an impact? Are you really helping animals? Every wonderful thing that has happened, every horrible thing that has happened, it started with one person. All it takes is one person, and then another, and another, and another. We're not doing this for us. We're doing it for them. The truth, it's about the horses. I'm a strong believer that one person can make a difference. Together, we can make a change. We're all the way down here in Texas. We're almost the Hooker Ranch Equine Refuge, and it's gonna be very interesting to see what they've got going on down here. Yeah, no, they're, um, from everything I can tell, they're a really good organization. Um, I followed them for a number, um, well, I followed them for a bit, and from what I can see, they're doing really good work. So I was really happy that they wanted to attend the workshop, and now we're gonna be checking out their facility. Um, I've talked to her a number of times. Um, she's been proactive on reaching out and asking for advice. And one of the things they did is they changed their name since the workshop. Yeah. It used to be really long. It used to be really long and complicated, so they shortened it up, so that's good. And then I know that a storm came through and did some damage um, to their, their property since the workshop. So it'll be really, really nice to catch up and you know, always at the workshop, there's so many people and it's so busy that we really can't connect with everything of how the organization got started and what's behind the organization. I know the the name Hooker has something to do with helicopters. She was in the uh, army. She was in the military or yeah. army or something. So um, it'll be nice to find out more about the organization's name. You know, kudos to every veteran. We appreciate each and every person who's willing to serve to keep us free and she went from keeping people free to now she's keeping horses free. So I yeah. think that's really awesome. Yeah, and like, I think she's like a helicopter mechanic. Like she's got a ton of talent, Yeah. but she's she's taking her passion and helping horses. And the need is huge in Texas, like. Oh, 100%, that's where they cross the border. It's where they cross the border. It's where, um, you know, there's a ton of horses, you know, just in the, the ranching culture and everything. So having a full circle of life uh, horse shelter in Texas is really, really good. And I hope that they will want to continue to be a full circle of life horse shelter.
Hey. Hi. It's been a little bit. Good to see you again. You too. And this must be your husband? Ken. Ken, nice to meet you. You too. Well, you all have a beautiful place here. Thank you. Yeah, I can't wait Welcome to. Welcome to our home. Thank you, thank you. Can't wait to see it all. My name and position at Hooker Ranch Equine Refuge is Lisa Smith, and I am the founder and president of the organization. My name is Kenneth Smith. I'm the vice president here at, at uh, Hooker Ranch Equine Refuge. And how many acres do you have? We have 20. Well, 19.99. Well, that's that's close <laughs> enough 20. to 20. Yes, yes. We are a veteran-owned um, nonprofit in Northeast Texas that saves equines from possibly entering the slaughter pipeline. We assist our community in helping owner surrender cases. Um, we take horses from the slaughter pipeline, we rehabilitate them, we rehome them, some we do therapy work with. And there's so many horses and so many equines that need our help, and we are well on our way to helping them. All right, so this is um, just a map. Obviously, it's not um, to scale of our home and our property and the rescue. And, and everything here in black is existing. Okay. So, um, this is the road that you came in on mm -hmm. in our home and you see we have this drive that's it's really great because it splits the property yeah so initially this three four acres up here was our quarantine okay and so when I bought the property I knew this would set up would be the best to mm -hmm. run a refuge or a rescue because it's split like that so hooker ranch comes from the job that I had in the military and what that was, was a Chinook helicopter mechanic and crew chief. Chinook helicopters in the army are called hookers and the people that work on them are called hookers. Um, that includes pilots, crew chiefs, and mechanics. Pretty much anybody that works on a Chinook in the army is called a hooker. And when we bought our land, we named it Hooker Ranch. We didn't want to call it anything else but that. And so it didn't make sense for us to call the rescue anything else but Hooker Ranch Equine Refuge. It was a great stepping stone for me in my life to, to be able to join the military and, and work on those helicopters. Um, and it's also where I, I got the chance to meet my wife. I wouldn't have met her if we both didn't happen to have the same job. Well, I would like to build a pole barn mm -hmm. um, off of the runs that we, the paddocks that we currently have. Um, we want to do a lane, mm -hmm. and you'll see when we do the tour going okay. down. And then, kind of like Horse Plus, I got the idea of doing these the um, runs, runs mm -hmm. and paddocks for different types of horses. Mm -hmm. Everything else um, is going to be open pasture okay. because we are working on sus making sustainable mm -hmm. food source yeah. our own hay. Nice. Um, when we bought this property, it was not used for anything. She mm -hmm. just looked at it essentially so it was all overgrown with wildflowers and weeds and okay. been working hard for a year and a half to get it to where we can harvest grass and hay um, and then another thing that we re i really want to do is do a memorial walk that people can come and go around the pond mm -hmm. we'll have plaques flowers things like that benches for people just to kind of hang out nice and no that's that's very nice one of the organizations we mentored in New Hampshire, Hidden Pond Farm Equine Rescue, they had a garden where their volunteers would go. And I'm like, you know, sometimes we see a lot of rough things and it's nice to be able to, you know, hey, just take 10 minutes in the garden or take, take a walk to the pond. Yeah, absolutely. What inspired me to start Hooker Ranch is actually um, a friend of mine that I had in my childhood. Her name is Jacqueline and she initially brought me to my first uh, holding pen outside of a slaughter facility in Minnesota. And that is how I found out about the slaughter pipeline. And we had a dream together to start an equine refuge. And that is how it was started. I know this is really hard on some volunteers and I've had volunteers come and go because yeah. of it. It's, I think they, you know, have 
The reality of what horses are facing in the United States is hard to stomach for a lot of people. It, it really is. And, and seeing know, the results of that can, cruelty. We can turn a blind eye to them and pretend they don't exist, or we can actually be there helping them and telling their story, and that's hard. What I saw at the slaughterhouse uh, were deplorable conditions, things I've never thought I would see as far as horses, uh, living conditions would go. I remember seeing 50 by 50 paddocks completely packed with horses, horses up to their hips and feces and manure with scald and rain rot, horses with snotty noses and horses with fused legs, broken legs. Uh, I've never seen anything like it in my entire life and it really stuck a memory with me. Ken is going to go and get our volunteers lined up ready okay. to work today. Awesome. So awesome. I'll be giving you your tour. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. I had two horses that were saved out of those feedlots that I kept at her place because I lived in town and we didn't have a farm. One of them was a Clydesdale and one of them was a off the track thoroughbred. And they were both really wonderful horses that just never had gotten another chance and they were slated to go into the slaughter house um, but we took them back and gave them a new life when i went to college my friend took care of those horses for me until they passed away because they were older then i went into the military and again had this dream and my plan on was to continue to do this um, refuge but after the military uh, unfortunately in 20 14, my friend passed away unexpectedly. And I really wanted to continue to do this and try and get this to happen, but I was really afraid to do it on my own because I didn't think I had the types of skills that she had to do it. So I had to learn things on my own. But when we found the property, I said, I'm just gonna do it and I'll figure it out along the way. And I started with one and got more as I got more skilled and, and now we've rescued over 43. When we first started um, the ranch, uh, I actually had to buy a, a pickup. Okay. And it wasn't this pickup. The pickup that we bought is on the other side of the shop okay. and it's an 88 Ford. And me and one of the volunteers were going to the vet one day and she's like, wow, your truck's really running great. And Boom! Oh, a rod blew. Oh no! So I was like, "All right, it's time to buy a truck with AC." Yeah. Now so, air conditioning is important. It's very important. Yes. So I went ahead and and got us a truck for the rescue, and this is our original trailer. Um, it's not a whole lot, but it's functional. It works. And another thing that you'll notice is that the the name change. We did yeah, we did so change our logo and I, our name. I know that when you came to the workshop. Yes. It was under this name, yes. which was a mouthful. Yes. Yes. So now you've got a new name, yes. which is a little bit more, I like Hooker Ranch Equine Refuge. Yes. Um, one thing that we found having logos on our vehicles at auctions can sometimes be, uh, you going know, to pull it off? Yes. 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 So, um, yes. And also I've had a couple of my mentors tell me, you know, make sure you take these off. If yeah. If you're going on a seizure, seizure case or anything like that. Absolutely. If you're assisting law enforcement and you're logoed up when you go in. Right. And they're like, that's where the horses are and they'll show up on your place. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. So yes, we've got good. magnets. Good, good. It's, it's good to be able to pull that off. Since coming back from the workshop, I have continued to reach out and network with some of the organizations that I met there. Uh, I didn't get to know all of the organizations very well while I was there, but some of them I got really close to. One of those organizations, when we fell on a hard time with having a tornado hit our farm, um, actually started a fundraiser on our behalf and helped us with that. And that was really crucial into helping us um, get some fences fixed and shelters rebuilt that got destroyed. Um, additionally, there's the organizations that felt like they were completely alone in some regards. And we were able to talk and have discussions and even continue to have discussions about some of the struggles we feel personally and emotionally, as well as um, what kinds of things 
um, we can do to better help the horses that we have. You know, we keep extra materials, donations, um, back here behind the shop, um, Cutting Edge Equine Veterinary Hospital. They just donated a hot walker to us. Oh, nice. Yes, yeah, so, oh, we're, so nice. we're actually going to sell it because we oh. don't have a real good use okay. for it. But, but that's so nice they donated it to you. Absolutely. Um, they've done all of our surgeries, our major surgeries. Fantastic hospital. What I took back from the Full Circle of Life workshop was definitely the advice on compassion fatigue, taking more time for myself and my family. Um, I implemented that. That makes me happier and in turn makes my volunteers happier <laughs> and how important social media videography is. Um, I learned about <laughs> uh, some more of the marketing and, and things that, I, again, I needed to come back and take more time and pay attention to. So our round pen is um, a 40 foot round pen. This is where we do our training. And you can see it's overgrown right now because of the summer months. We don't do any kind of training. It's just too hot. So if you're out here in the sun, it would be it's brutal. rough on everybody. It's really brutal. Uh, eventually we'd like to cover it, maybe clear out these trees, expand it. Nice, um, nice. So that's, and we got that through uh, the Prefert Seconds Yard, which Prefert Manufacturing is right in Mount Pleasant and they have an outlet. So anything with the Prefert name on it here, we got at extremely reduced cost. Oh, that's, that's awesome, that's awesome. To include this round pen. So. Wow. One of my biggest challenges out here in Winsboro is getting volunteer support and Part of that is my own doing, not getting out into the community more because I stay so busy here. The other issue is the community is a little bit older. Um, the volunteers that I, I get have been really wonderful. It, it's just limited as far as who can really come out because of school and situations like that. So this is all pasture that we have been working on turning into a hay field so we can make our own our own food and sustain our own hay. So with all this sand everywhere, is sand colic an issue? Um, no, it is, but it isn't. So the horses that we get here, um, they usually come in from different areas unless they are owner surrenders, local owner surrenders. We do sand rid everybody once a okay. month as a precaution. Um, but I've never actually had a colic out here. Our volunteers do a lot of different things and they're not all local. We have volunteers as far as California. Um, I have a wonderful lady in California that does um, our marketing. She designs our brochures and she's currently working on updating our website. We have local volunteers that do training, that do you know, the stall work that needs to happen. Um, as you saw, we were building stalls or Philip, he built our, our stock for us. Um, we have, you know, the actual groundwork here, but again, we don't need volunteers to just be local. We've had volunteers come and go from far away as well out of state. And that's been extremely beneficial to a small rescue like ours. My name is Philip Connor and I've, uh volunteered uh, with Lisa out here for about a year now. And of course, there's not as much as I can do anymore, but I do most of the, the mowing and stuff on the tractor and keeping the pastures in shape uh, and fertilizing and that sort of thing. My name is Rebecca Teeny, and I am a volunteer at the Hooker Ranch. I come out to Hooker Ranch as Lisa needs me, but most of my work I do at my facility. I live only about three, four miles away. My name is Summer Green. I am a volunteer here at Hooker Ranch Equine. I've been volunteering for about eight months, um, working on close to a year. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> I actually drove by here for a year wondering what was going on. So I did stop and I met Miss Lisa and Mr. Ken and they told me that they are veterans and that it's for one of their helicopters, which is really cool. I love veterans. And 
I just love what she does. She puts her heart and soul into these horses, and it's just been one of my dreams that she's living, and I'm actually getting the chance to live it with her. This is our main barn or our sanctuary barn, so any horses that um, stay here permanently or are done with rehab awaiting adoption, um, they live down here. And the only thing that existed when we moved here was this shed, and it was like a, a vehicle shed or an okay. equipment shed. It was completely full of garbage. Oh, I spent, that's fun. <laughs> spent three weeks cleaning it out. I rented a bobcat and um, got it all leveled, and then we started building stalls and a feed room. And so it has three 12 by 12 stalls, and it has a feed room um, where we keep all of our feed. And then we did two 50 by 50 paddocks here. There's so much to do uh, in an operation like this because it's a 24-7 type thing. You don't just, you know, shut it down uh, and it happens uh, every day. You know, I just appreciate the opportunity to come out here uh, and uh, help and try to do things that I couldn't do on my own anymore. I think like, you know, in her logo, it takes a village and it really does. And I don't think people understand that till, you know, you've been really involved in organizations. I wish them the best of luck. And I am so happy that she's able to network with Horse Plus and other organizations in the area and I hope that they can make it from here on out. I am the shelter manager also when she's not here. I try to do my best on keeping up with the horses and maintaining the facility. So far I'm fairly new at this but I've been taught a lot and I love what Lisa does and I love the horses. They're wonderful. These Paddocks, the purpose of them is so everybody has their own place to eat without being bothered by somebody else. And then we decided that we needed to split one of the paddocks for runs. We have a pony and he's, he lives here permanently. He's our mascot. And so he needed his own run to keep him from overeating. And then we have a place for the other um, horses to, to eat by themselves. So in addition to the volunteers, we also need um, funding and grant assistance as well. We do pay for any kind of capital gains as far as fencing, uh, buildings and structures like that as we can on our own. We try and make sure every donation goes to the horses, whether it be food or veterinary care. Um, but without those donations coming in, um, we can't continue to help more horses. And last year alone, uh, we had a ridiculous amount of veterinary costs. And it's something that we have to fund. And the only way to fund that is through donations. My husband and I are funding most of the organization ourselves. We, um, he works full time from home and, and watches our son at the same time. Um, so that we can continue to pay for things for these horses um, so that we can help as many as we can. I buy hay from my neighbor and it's um, $80 a round. Okay. And that's fertilized coastal. Okay. And it's averaging $10 a bale for squares. It's good, it's still cheap. What about like alfalfa? Uh, if you can find it, mm -hmm. it's expensive. Yeah. Last year, I had a generous donation of a semi truckload full of alfalfa from Nebraska. It's third cutting, but it's, it's, so it's not something. really locally grown. No, okay. it is not grown in Texas because of blister beetle. Yeah, okay. So it has to be imported. Gotcha. So this is um, Shirley. She's Hi, blind. Shirley. Um, it's okay, girl. We're here. Hey. Hi. Hi, girl. Aww. So with her, um, you just have to be very deliberate about yeah. touching her. Where she knows where you're at. Miss Lisa is just a wonderful person. She's great. Like I said earlier, she puts her heart and her soul into this. And it's just unbelievable of what she does for these horses. I've seen the blonde Belgian go from a wild, not knowing 
anything from not being able to see and being scared to now she's calm, she accepts us, and she's doing a lot better than what she was when she first started, when I first started. So we have uh, three 12 by 12 stalls in here that we've built. And again, it just serves a purpose for feeding. Yeah. The horses aren't stalled up all day. Uh, we keep them in a pasture type environment and in a herd environment so that they can socialize. So what we've done here is we've made little shelters. These are just temporary uh, shelters and they work really good for a couple of years until the sun cooks them. Um, that way each horse, if I have to pen them for mm -hmm. some reason overnight, they have a little shelter. Nice. Um, and then our plans are to put some shade cloths up mm -hmm. here as well. And this is where, again, we can feed uh, individually is pretty much the only purpose. Yeah. We don't keep them in their long term. In their long term. Well, and it works great. There was one point, you know, we didn't have all the facilities that we have now, and we had almost the same setup, mm -hmm. little little carpet. And it's like, well, you know, they're not that expensive, and they provide That's good right. shelter, and That's you right. can put panels up to them. So. And Ken and I are, you know, both prior aircraft mechanics. Mm -hmm. So our plan was, after the canvas goes bad, we can actually take our donated sheet metal and pop rivet okay. to the frame. Nice. And make better temporary yes. shelters. <laughs> there you go, there you go. When it comes to horses that we have to make end of life decisions for, it can be really hard on our volunteers. No matter how hard I try to prepare them mentally, we always have volunteers that it affects harder than others. Some of those volunteers, they have to step away and they don't come back. And it's not something I fault them personally for. Um, each person deals with things in their own way. And as hard as we try for every horse, some of them, the nicest and kindest thing that we can do for them is give them the last act of kindness. So this is Jewel and she is um, 36 years old and she uh, was rescued from the slaughter pipeline um, and she was extremely emaciated. I mean, the most emaciated horse I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, I spent five hours getting her stable enough to transport and we got her here and we picked her up every day with the tractor for two months. Mm. And it was exhausting. And I told her, I said, if you make it through this, you can live here forever. And she did. And she's extremely vibrant and she's extremely sweet. And she's one of the most well-mannered horses I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And she's an absolute jewel. A lot of people say, oh, the horse is skinny because it's old. And it, it's really so irritating to me because usually they're skinny because they, they have teeth problems, they're not getting enough nutrition, or there's some type of organ failure going on. And it's just, it's so sad because clearly here she was the old skinny horse and with proper care, she looks, she looks amazing. And people like to use old age as an excuse for not caring for their horse properly and upping that level of care that an older horse needs. Yeah, she is an Arabian, so she's smaller framed. Um, in the winter time, she gets ridiculously wide, has this huge belly that hangs on her, but she always has hip points. Yeah, and with an older horse, you'll see changes like that, but they shouldn't be emaciated. If, they're, if an older horse is emaciated and not gaining weight, there could be organ failure going on. There could be a whole host of, of chronic medical conditions. And it's like, would you want to prolong organ failure? Then, you know, if you have an old horse, get it checked out by a veterinarian and get to the bottom of what those, those issues are. I think it's really important for people to understand that compassion fatigue is real. Um, we learned about compassion fatigue. We revisited it in the Full Circle of Life workshop. Um, I personally had reached out to Tawny prior to the workshop about the compassion fatigue that I was feeling. And it's really important that you take time for yourself and that your organization takes time 
um, as a whole, like your volunteers um, and any kind of staff members, because it doesn't just affect one person, it affects everybody. And the more that you're around mentally stressing and taxing things to include the horses, um, social media, anything, you need to really focus on getting out of there and taking breaks. One thing that I really want to do um, is I want to create a path going down to our pond. We have this large pond down here and the horses enjoy it. We really enjoy it. And I want to create a pathway that goes down here and circles around the back of the pond and do um, like a memorial garden. Nice. And it's one of the things I put in my long-term plan because I want people to go, it's so tranquil out here and I want people to be able to go and take a break and reflect on some of the horses that we've had. Um, my four prior dogs are buried down here Hi. and we have a stone for them. We want to do plaques for each horse. Uh, we want to do benches and, you know, have pretty flowers and things for the butterflies and just somewhere that we can all take a break. My five-year plan is to increase our capacity. Um, and in order to do that, I need to bring in more volunteers. I'd like to eventually have um, one or two paid employees. Um, I want to see horses being trained, horses being cared for. All at the same time, the organization has something always going on. We're always active. So the pond is really peaceful out here and you know there are some fish here and the horses like to come down and act like little hippos and wait in it. We really enjoy it a lot. It's a nice feature on our property. In the drought like times like you know rain just heat does this pond dry up at all? Last year it almost dried up and we actually fed it for two weeks wow. with our, our well to keep it from drying up because we do have fish in here and we don't want them to die. Some of our current goals that we'd like to see happen uh, soon is we want to get our, our medical area set up. Uh, we got to get a slab poured and, and uh, a cover for it and we're trying to get some scales that way we can see the progress of the horses when they come in when we intake so we can weigh them, we know what they start at, we know what they're going to, so we have a, a way to tell what their progress is. You know, some of our longer term plans is we wanna be able to have a, a barn down there that will sustain more horses that we can put into, uh, into stalls and everything so that they have their own space as needed. We're gonna go up to what used to be our quarantine but now, since we have a new quarantine facility, um, it is our medical area. And this is where we stall horses for medical treatments, or we have them under watch, or in the current case, when they come over from quarantine, this is their uh, soft, soft quarantine. Soft quarantine, no, that's herd, good. Mm -hmm. How they talk to the herd. They can see the herd, they can meet the herd, they can't touch the herd. Can't go nose to nose with the herd. So this is Oasis, and he came from auction. Um, we initially were told that his leg was broken, and we were going to provide him with the last act of kindness right away. Um, but when we got him, what we found out is that he has a um, deep digital flexor tendon, tendon issue. issue. Um, our veterinarian wanted us to try and do a couple of months of therapeutic shoeing with him and sweats for the mm -hmm. swelling, which we have been doing. And he still is, is painful on it because his heels are coming down. Um, but overall, he's doing pretty good. And then we, we really reevaluate horses like this. We'll reevaluate them um, every couple of weeks mm -hmm. and depend, determine at that time what we're going to do with them. If they're progressing and you're saying that they're doing good, then you can, can continue with the treatments. But working with your veterinarian to determine, you know, is it is it getting better or is it not, or is it exceeding the organization's financial abilities? That's right. Another big goal of mine 
Because of the shortage of veterinary clinics in the general area, I want to create a facility that has the equipment and the tools needed to provide veterinary care for horses, where our veterinarians or other veterinarians or student veterinarians can come in and do the things that they need to do by us providing the tools and medication. So this is Wednesday and she's branded um, bucking stock out of North Dakota. And when I initially saw her at the auction, um, I was like, no, mm -hmm. bucking stock's kind of like, you just don't, but. A lot of them go to slaughter. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, we went ahead and, and we grabbed her. She was extremely emaciated. And we, um, you know, we worked miracles with our blind horse and we thought we would try with her. And yeah. she's come around a ton already. We're really excited about what she's going to turn into. Currently, uh, whenever I first started around here, coming to Miss Lisa's, it there wasn't very many horses, but overall for the year that I've been working with her and going to different things, I've been seeing more horses. Um, we're currently wanting to do more owner surrenders so that we can keep the horses out of the pipeline and from going to slaughterhouses. So this is our medical barn or QT barn, and it's a 12 by 24 double stalled, matted, fanned, cushy barn. They're very nice. Um, we we did this one initially, this stall, and again, they're they've got the padding because we get cases of chronic founder, severe laminitis, um, and. They have automatic waterers, um, pretty much everything for a horse to be stalled all day. Anytime I have a surgical hold or a medical hold where the horses stay for a long term, this is where they stay. And my big goal is to build a second one of these kitty corner. They'll share the paddock and the pasture is for them. And this pasture is less rich than that pasture, makes it great for laminitic horses. So nobody in Texas um, in the northeastern part of Texas has a crematorium large enough for equines. And we could provide a massive need if we had our own crematorium here. Right now, the only options for disposal is burial or landfill. So this is a Amish horseshoeing stock mm -hmm. and the kit was graciously donated to us. And our local um, sawmill actually cut all this lumber, raw lumber. So that you had the, the pattern donated, basically, or the, uh, the, the metal the brackets, metal, okay. Um, we have one at our facility, and we ended up getting the whole package. So all the wood and everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it looks extremely similar. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. no, they're, they're great, because you get these Amish draft horses, and they, they don't really know how to pick up their feet. This is what they're trained to do. Absolutely. Some of them will just put their feet on it like they've done it all their lives. Some of them it takes a little more convincing, but for the most part, it keeps our farrier and us a lot safer, safer as well as the horses. Horseshoe stock that we have down there for the, uh, the big draft horses, uh, I built that and I built it here uh, we had people that uh, funded uh, that thing as a parts kit uh, from uh, an Amish producer up there that had them. And uh, we got the lumber uh, sourced locally and just assembled it from there. And I did it here uh, at the, the thing. And it's so big and heavy, of course, I had to have help from time to time uh, handling the pieces on it. But we got it all together and it, it works great. So this is our two horse trailer and we got this as a donation a few weeks ago. Um, all we had to do was put new tires on it and pull it out and we use it to bring our pony to events. He's our mascot and makes it a lot easier on everybody and not having to have a, a gooseneck. And we can also use it as a backup trailer. Oh, that's great. And these little trailers can be so useful, especially training a horse that 
to get in the little trailer. Because yes. when adopters show up with the little trailer, yes. and you've worked the horse, and the horse knows to get into the, the little trailer on site, you save a lot of time. Absolutely. Being here has changed my life in multiple ways. Um, it has brought back my personal bubbly self. Um, I've been able to open up to Miss Lisa in ways that I couldn't with others. I've gained new friends that are just wonderful. And it has made it to where I can actually deal with the public better. Uh, the horses help me a lot mentally. Uh, I do have some mental disabilities, but they help me a lot with that. And being able to go and see other facilities too and learn. It's all about learning and I love it. Okay, so this is where we quarantine all of our horses and we have this beautiful paddock to use. On the back side of this garage is a two stall little mini barn. Nice. Um, and then obviously um, she's got these buildings here and she said we can use all of them as storage. We have no hay storage on site. Okay. Um, if we were to win the 15,000, one of our plans is to get a storage container, mm -hmm. uh, like a shipping crate to put behind our barn for hay and feed. And that way we can utilize more of the space in the barn. Um, but until then, our hay donations go in the hay barn, our square bales go in here. Okay. And all of our other storage is out here. This uh, little shelter right here is great two stall shelter, loafing shed that they can come lay in um, or relax. Or if we need to uh, start an IV or anything like that, we can put the horse in here and take one of our cattle panels and gate it. Those tent panels are so helpful and we can do so much with them and then we'll just hang the fluids and get them going. Uh, when we got Wednesday, the Bronc, um, a month and a half ago, she was in here and we were giving her fluids because of her dehydration. And it's just really fantastic to have this and a neighbor to help us like they do. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's so nice to have a completely off-site quarantine facility. Because if you bring in a horse with strangles or anything, like you can come over, care for the horse, totally disinfect before you go back to your main facility. Absolutely. So this is really, really ideal. I know that um, one of the other organizations within the network, they have offsite and they were like, should we bring it on site? I'm like, no. If no. at all possible, have offsite, keep your offsite quarantine. Well, thanks so much for the tour. I would love to sit down with you and really hear more about why you started this organization and the name behind it all and you know what's what's the passion behind this organization absolutely it's really been great you know i try and do anything and everything i can to help support and i do a lot of the help with the building of anything that we've got to get constructed uh, try and plan out what what we need to make sure we got materials and everything tooling wise or try and get people out here to help support when we try and do a big build. Uh, if we got something coming up, I'll let people know, hey, you know, we're, we're planning on doing this add on either some paddocks or we got to build another uh, shelter. You know, we got this kind of plan coming up. If you're interested to come out and help out, you know, try and get people to come out and see us. And so we'll go ahead and take this up yeah. and we'll start kind of load it and then we'll start measuring it out and cutting and make it happen. So we're gonna we're gonna line the stall with wood just like this other stall that way we can it helps protect the horses so if they're in here they get spooked and they kick they're not gonna kick through the metal hurt their legs or anything we want them to be safe as possible so we're gonna line the back and this side wall about the same height as the rest of it. That way everybody's protected and safe when they're in here. Well, we're going to cut one board that'll go just vertical right here. That way, and we'll screw it to here. That way when these boards go in, we have something to screw into. And we're going to go about this, this tall, yeah. We just need the one there, and we'll do one here too. That way we can screw into it. 
And then when we do this side, we'll just screw into the two by four. Since the workshop, a lot has happened with your organization. Um, I know you've restructured how, you know, some of the people that were helping within your organization and you changed your name. How's it been with all this transitioning? I mean, like there's new shirts, there's yes. a new logo. Yes, it's been a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. uh, I was really afraid to change our name because we went to the workshop as Hooker Ranch Slaughter Horse Rescue but it wasn't what we were doing exclusively and it really needed a change. Um, not only that, but the personnel changes were really scary because we had personnel that had been working with us from the very beginning mm -hmm. that are no longer with us. And we had to work through that. I know that sometimes when organizations rely on a single donor, that person can end up controlling the organization. And I've seen a lot of organizations really suffer when, because their organization is built off of their support. Years later, that person steps away and leaves, leaves you hanging. Right. And so I think, you know, definitely focusing on what your organization is and the mission and focusing on that is really gonna help your organization go a long ways. So I've downloaded MailChimp mm -hmm. and I have not been able to make the time to learn it. And that's what I really struggle with. We have all these wonderful tools that we got from you and Jason, but for me to sit down and find the time to learn each and everything, it's been really difficult for me to do that. So something you said earlier today um, is that you have this great uh, volunteer that takes care of all the animals. And she's even told you, <laughs> take the time to go in, I, you're not needed out here. I've got this, I got to take her advice and then take the time to step away. When you have somebody, you know, that's there as a volunteer, a lot of times you feel like you need to be there too. Sometimes, and yeah. <laughs> when it's a volunteer, like they're in charge of, you know, these different duties, you don't need to be there holding their hand during those duties. And then that will give you free time to develop into like, hey, we need to get our email marketing going and stuff. So sometimes it is just taking that time to step away. Part of that is the military. Uh, it's really hard to follow a leader that doesn't show by example. Mm -hmm. And it's 106 degrees out here. And with me not out here being in the sweat and the pain with, mm -hmm. with them, it's really hard on me because I don't want to watch anybody else work and sacrifice. Yeah. You know, she's a volunteer, but this is her job. It is. And you got to give her the space just like you would an, an employee to, you know, give you time so you can go. And not everybody in the military is out there doing everything. That's true. Compassion fatigue, it can, it can be a real killer of horse rescues and organizations. And I know Prior to the workshop, you were confronted with it and were suffering from it. Um, how do you see yourself avoiding compassion fatigue? Because I know you mentioned you like to sew and, and those things are great. So what do you do outside of horses so you don't get compassion fatigue and where it, it just shuts your organization down? My favorite thing to do is spend time with my family. And we'll go on a little weekend trip to different parts of Texas or around other states and just go explore and hang out together. One of my favorite things to do is take my three-year-old to toy stores and spoil him. Uh, I also, as you said, I sew. Uh, I love to quilt and I love to make toys out of sewing materials. So like dolls and teddy bears and things like that's, that. That's awesome. <laughs> and it's so important. The first time I learned about compassion fatigue, I remember that um, the instructor was saying, even if you knit, you just do something 
that takes your brain off of horses, 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 or animals, animals, animals constantly. And, you know, obviously we love horses and we love animals and that's why we get into this, but we see horrible things. And if we're not taking our mind and distracting it with something positive, it ultimately can destroy your organization. So just keeping that work-life balance, you know, family. I like to say God first, then the family, and then everything else trickles down from there. You know, work-life balance is so important. I hate to make it about money, but I really want to learn how to be more self-sustainable without personal funds. Mm -hmm. Um, because you and your husband are basically supporting a majority of yes a majority of, of the rescue and we have the potential to be gigantic as I saw from the workshop and going to your facility we have the same acreage mm -hmm. we could easily hook, set up hooker ranch to look just like mm -hmm. horse plus's facility I really want to go to boot camp because I want to go see the process that horse plus does for their intakes um, I want to go to auction with you and I want to understand that process. Um, have somebody walk me through it a little bit more. Um, when I talked about my friend earlier and the reason why uh, I started this, she did all of our auction stuff. She did all the bidding. So I've really not jumped in there and done it yet. Additionally, I want to make closer relationships with the people that are also getting selected. So I do want to extend an invitation to you to come to boot camp. Oh! Yes, you will be, you'll be coming to boot camp. You'll get to bid on horses at the auction and no. you'll get to see the whole thing. Stop yes. it. No, no, you are coming. I saw it in your face. You were like, do I tell her now? Do I tell her now? Do I tell her now? <laughs> <laughs> so oh yes, I, I don't hide a, hide a secret very well no. when I start thinking about it. <laughs> but yeah, no, so you're coming to boot camp. <laughs> I'm so excited. Oh, well, I'm excited for you. Oh. And um, hopefully the weather will be a little cooler uh, than we're experiencing today. Um, but yeah, so bring, bring any of the questions or anything in the meantime uh, to me and then we will see you at boot camp. Keep taking care of the horses in Texas. Thank you guys. All right, you take care. <laughs> We've just left Hooker Ranch Blue Point Refuge and it's was really nice hanging out with Lisa and Ken. I think they're doing an amazing work out there. They're very passionate about their organization and I think that they they could do a lot of really great things here in Texas. They're a young organization, but they get the mission and they get the philosophy and they help so many horses in, in really rough situations and horses that are very adoptable. So um, yeah, we invited them to boot camp. I would say that it was the hottest filming we did. Like we had equipment shutting down, it was so hot. So It is so <laughs> incredibly hot. The truck um, says 103, so, you know. And, you know, I just, I think that, you know, these organizations that we're going and we're visiting to, like, we know these organizations, we know, like, we feel comfortable having them within our network. And there's a lot of organizations that we didn't get to go visit. Um, just because there's only so much time that we have, but you know, for the organizations that we're able to go visit and film and feature, like we know these organizations are good organizations. And uh, for the organizations that, that we weren't able to go to, um, you know, that are actively within the network, you know, they're still part of the network, but um, I wish we could go to every organization, but um, boot camp's going to be pretty amazing, I think. <laughs>